foundation of the car if you look at the rolling chassis out there you can see some of the guts which to engineers is really the beautiful part the part that's underneath and uh, we learned how to do aluminum structures pretty well on the seventh generation and we took everything we learned and made it even better on the eighth generation uh, the new car is fabricated an entirely new body shop in Bowling Green so if you go over there you'll see the whole C7 body shop and a whole C8 body shop uh, kind of side by side so it was a big investment for us uh, to create a unique in the world mid-engine good uh, luggage room open air architecture that's a solution that we've been working on for a long time making all those things happen and it required a lot of new technology if you look at uh, the construction of this thing you'll see that there's uh, what we call high pressure die castings there's six gigantic castings uh, they're about four feet long and they make up the most complicated parts uh, of the structure so if you look at uh, every place you see where there's ribs and things so this whole corner all the way down here that's one casting on both sides and the same thing from here all the way up through the shock towers all the way back here is also high pressure die casting then there's cradles underneath you can't see the one on the back that also have these massive high pressure die castings we use that because high pressure die casting is the best way to form aluminum in the world you power the aluminum into the mold and so you don't get porosity you get really good material properties and you can cast parts with very thin walls and do very thin ribs, which is very mass efficient. You take all these complicated interfaces and you can put them all in one part, uh, and that's a real winner. Not having all those joints is a real win for body structure integrity. When we went to go find a company to make this, because General Motors doesn't do a ton of casting, especially high pressure die casting, we found there was nobody in the world willing to do this size, this quantity, and this quality of casting uh, for Corvettes. There just wasn't anybody. And so we had to do it ourselves. We had to go back to General Motors leadership and say, we got to learn how to do this. And so we actually went back and appropriated, did a business case for it, went back and appropriated money and built out our Bedford, Indiana plant, put in a new assembly area. Uh, it's a plant where they cast blocks and heads. It's not the exact same kind of process, but at least they're somewhat familiar with casting. So we actually brought this, we insourced this uh, so that we could build the volume we wanted of this kind of technology and it's a huge enabler to make this whole body structure work So it's amazing we've gotten this far. We really haven't talked about that engine very much I'm amazed that uh, we got away with it um, So, uh, you know, everybody knows the, the headlines 495 horsepower 470 foot-pounds of torque 0 to 60 under 3 seconds, top speed 194 miles an hour. So um, I said it at the reveal, uh, at a time when the whole rest of the world is going to small displacement, charged engines, um, we're bucking the trend and staying with the, the small, black, small block V8. It's a huge competitive advantage for us. It's a very compact engine. It's very light for the power it puts out. Having that engine compactness helped us with the body structure because we could make load pass around the engine uh, and having it small made those very, very efficient. So um, the architecture uh, in return helped out the engine. So uh, putting the engine in the back makes the breathing uh, a lot more effective. So when the engine's in the front, it, the throttle's on the front and it has to read cool air and you have this big radiator forward of it that goes right up to the hood. And so that's why you see these uh, snorkel arrangements we've had that either get really thin and wide, reach over the top of the radiator, or on C7, you take a turn and you go out to the behind the headlamp. And it's a very compressed space up there, and so it's very difficult to get low restriction intake systems. The same thing on the exhaust when the engine is in the front, you take the exhaust out the manifolds and it has to get down to the center tunnel and there's a pinch point because we've got the engine shoved rearward as far as we can, right up against the front of dash, and then trying to snake exhaust through where your pedal box is, the throttle and everything, and you've got to get into the tunnel. There's a pinch point there between the block and the body structure and where the passengers need to be, and you actually have to compress the exhaust, you dent the pipes, and it's a very restrictive uh, area in the car. 
when you put the engine in the back, if you've seen the engine out there, we've got these like really cool header, short headers that come out over the top and they can go down under the luggage arm. There's no pinch point. And so both on the intake side and the exhaust side, we have very low restriction on this. So we're able to take advantage of that with the cam timing uh, to get a very free breathing engine that pulls very hard all the way to redline, uh, puts the power peak up at 495 uh, horsepower. So that's a way that the car's architecture helps the engine guys perform better. So uh, we also have a DCT. I don't remember, do I have something on the DCT? No. Okay, but um, I do want to talk about this. We haven't talked about this much. You'll see some of the cars out there. Uh, you know, we go to Corvette shows uh, all over, and we know how much people like to customize their car. A lot of the hoods are up at, at shows, and people have done things to make their engine and their engine compartment more beautiful. And so we said, well, why not do that from the factory? And so um, we've got these very large uh, vented uh, carbon panels to close out either side uh, of the engine compartment, and then we mounts it. Uh, so this is additional lighting. So when you open the hatch, the lights in the luggage uh, light up. But when you get this option, you get the carbon panels plus additional lights uh, that are mounted to the underside of the hatch. So when you open up, the whole engine bay is all lit up, uh, bathed in light. And then as you approach the car and you turn, you know, you lock it or unlock it, and all the courtesy lights come on, it lights up too. And so you, as you approach your car, you can actually see the engine. Uh, kind of blowing in there. It's a really cool option. Um, it, it hasn't got a ton of airplay, but you can uh, go out and check it out on some of the cars uh, out here. So uh, Z51. Uh, we've had Z51 for decades and decades. Um, we have it. It's a little bit different this time, uh, but it is essentially, you know, if you're going to track your car, it's a must-have option. Um, Harlan didn't mention it, when he's going through all the standard equipment, one of the things we did was make dry sump standard. And uh, you know, we've been working on dry sump for a long time. Making it standard let us mount the engine lower in the chassis. It's uh, about an inch lower than on today's car. And so even if you get the standard car, you get the advantage of the dry sump. You get that uh, nice low engine, lower center of gravity. And because we made it standard, all engines have the dry sump, so we didn't have to do a version with and without. And so we were able to integrate the content for the dry sump into the base engine. So instead of one scavenge pump, we have three. So a traditional one coming out of the sump under the engine, but we also have two in the heads. And you might think, well, why do I need to pump oil out of the head? It's just going to run back down into the sump anyway. But on a 90 degree V8, each of the banks of cylinders is sitting at an angle of 45 degrees to the ground. When you're cornering at 1G, you have a lateral force of 1G and a downward force of 1G. And the net result is a 45 degree angle. So the oil inside the engine doesn't want to flow up and it doesn't want to flow down. But when you're cornering at 1G, the body rolls a little bit and actually the engine inside the body rolls a little bit, so the engine is actually laying more than 45 degrees, so the oil doesn't go down, it runs up. So when you're cornering hard, it's actually the engine oil wants to go up into the valve covers, and that's why you have sumps on either side to take that oil out, plumb it, cool it, deaerate it, and feed it back to the engine, so the engine always has nice, cool uh, oil with no air in it. So we made that standard, uh, but there's still lots of content uh, in Z51. Uh, you get the summer performance tires. We've even talked about the uh, all-season tires, but you do get uh, you know, track-oriented summer tires. You get FE3 performance suspension, adjustable threaded spring seats. It's kind of a racy uh, thing. Somebody was asking me the other day how you uh, adjust the, the height of the car. You can put FE4 uh, magnetic ride control on, on top of that. And this isn't just the same MR that we've had previously. This is a fourth generation. Uh, we were pioneers in this technology uh, way back when. Now we're on to the fourth generation. And the big deal with this is that we actually put accelerometers on the knuckle. So right out where the tires drive loads into the body, we put accelerometers on the knuckle. And that lets us read what's happening at the wheel much quicker. 
to take advantage of that with our new electrical architecture, which transmits messaging four times as fast, and we can really perceive what's happening out at the tire, and then we have software that can take advantage of this. It's the best riding uh, suspension we've ever had. Of course, you get bigger brakes, uh, you get extra cooling. The cooling's really cool. You got the two radiators up front that Kirk was talking about. And uh, when you get Z51, when the coolant comes back, uh, we actually cool it again. We have a heat exchanger inside the big quarter panel opening to kind of super cool the coolant. And then we use that to cool the loop for the trans and the oil for the engine, keeping all those temps uh, very low. So that comes with Z51. Uh, ELSD. Uh, so we've had ELSD as part of Z51 since the last generation. This time it's part of the DCT, so it's integrated into the transaxle. Since we have 60% of the weight on the rear wheels, it makes it more effective than ever. It's a huge enabler for us to do dynamic vehicle control. Um, it, it makes the car really, really benign uh, to handle. This, this car is so easy to learn how to drive at the limit. It's, it's incredible. So Kirk talked a little bit about the, the Aero, 400 pounds of downforce at 180 miles an hour. The car actually goes faster than that, so there actually would be a little more downforce at top speed. But again, uh, this is the first time we've had a Stingray with real full vehicle downforce. Great cooling, and then uh, also includes NPP. Everybody likes NPP. Uh, it really gives you the sound quality, the tunability, the adjustability, customizability. Uh, that everybody likes. You can have it very quiet, or you can have that ground-pounding American thunder that you guys all like. Dad, where's the, Dad, where's the third radiator? The third radiator is in the quarter ducts. You see those big ducts in the back? The third one is actually, we have power fans on both sides, but you get a radiator in addition to that on Z51. And here's a picture showing uh, some of those cooling paths. You can see the cool air going in. You can see the radiator. I think Kirk uh, covered most of this. Uh, but that blue air going in, that uh, goes into that heat exchanger. So this is a little complicated, but uh, I want to talk about this a little bit. It's really, uh, I was talking about how low restriction the intake is. So um, the air going through the top of the opening, so you kind of see it up here. This is a view kind of low looking. We've got the skin peeled off. Here's the rear brakes. You can see there's a flow path here. That's actually the air going into the engine. So if you look at it as you're looking at it from the top, here's those same blue lines. They come into the top part of that quarter opening and they actually flow through passages we created out of the body panels that need to be there anyway, the structural body panels. So there's no separate duct. Uh, it's just the, the panels that go out and support the quarter panel uh, creates a very large opening. You can stick your arm right through it. it. It's so large. It goes behind the engine, takes a turn, goes through a very large air box. The rolling chassis shows this. You can see it very clearly. We have a big kind of old school air filter, big oval air for lots of surface area, so very low restriction. Uh, that's positioned on vehicle center line, and that feeds the throttle body on the back of the engine. So that's good in two ways. One is it reduces restriction. The other is the sound waves that are created by the engine breathing are actually transmitted back up and out that same opening, so it's just over your shoulder. Uh, at the rear of the door, and that's a very good sound. That's the kind of engine sound they want to hear, that strong induction V8 sound. And so that's a way we actually can create a noise path intentionally back to the occupant that you can hear. Uh, steering. So we've talked a lot about steering. Part of the architecture is uh, the driving experience, less weight on the front wheels, car turns in really quickly, and we didn't talk about the fundamentals, but just sitting this much closer to the front axle shortens the steering. I mean, it almost looks like a ridiculous proportion, but this is the real math of today's car, where you sit and how long the steering column is, intermediate shaft, by the time you get to the rack, you're one 1,600 uh, millimeters away, 1 1.6 meters, you can see we've shortened it 
substantially, much more direct uh, connection to the to the steering gear. So that gives you the, a very stiff system, and a stiff system means that the second you move the wheel at all, you get a reaction at the front tires and the vehicle starts to move. We also have the tightest turn circle, uh, which we've ever had, because we have an even longer wheelbase than today, even wider track than today, yet the turn circle is tighter, especially if you get MR. And the reason why is that we have uh, a new invention. We use the position sensors that come with MR that tell you where the wheel is in the position relative to the body, and we have a dynamic rack stop. So typically on a rack and pinion, uh, steering, you have a mechanical stop at the end. But on this car, when you get to the end of travel, all it is is doing is back driving the motor electronically. It feels like a stop, it feels like a hard stop, but all it is is the rack not letting you turn it anymore. And that way you can adjust that stop based on conditions. So typically in vehicle design, you have to design that mechanical stop for the worst case condition, which is typically when you turn the wheel at full lock, and you drive in a steep driveway ramp and you're trying to pick the car up by that inside front tire so you push the wheel all the way up towards the body and you have to make sure that that tire's not going to touch anything. And you have to restrict the travel based on that. But any time the wheel's in any other place, you could actually turn farther and it would be okay. So what we're doing is using that position sensor to look at where the wheel is and in most cases where you're just doing a parking lot maneuver, you can actually let the the car turned more sharply. And so a, a 36 foot turn circle curve to curve for a vehicle of this size and proportion is uh, kind of unique in the world. Okay. So the front lift system, this is the one thing, when we did the reveal, it's this giant space and it was really hard to hear what the audience reaction was from up on stage, because there was just this giant space. Everybody was so far away and all the sound got lost. But the one thing I did hear is all the hoorays and the applause when we said we were going to do this front lift system. So, you know, Corvettes historically, uh, they're very low cars, low center of gravity. They need uh, very low aerodynamic panels, and so it doesn't take much of a speed bump or a ramp. You can hear the air dam scraping on the bottom or rub the chin of the, the car. So uh, we've long wanted to do this, and actually um, I'm a big defender of the transverse composite springs we've been using for years, and I know the media celebrate so celebrating getting rid of the leaf springs. They're not leaf springs. In fact, if we could have done transverse composite springs on this car, we would have. We couldn't because the drive line is mounted so low there's no cross car path to put it. So we're essentially forced to go to coil over shocks. But the good news is that let us put a relatively simple hydraulic lift under the, the front spring on the nose of the car that let us power that thing up for about two inches. So that's another button that you hit right on the center console. And every time you hit that button, well the first time you hit it at a, at a certain location, a screen will pop up at the DIC saying, do you want to remember this? You just hit the button on the steering wheel and it remembers it forever. So every time you approach that obstacle, it'll automatically lift. So, you know, we announced we can... That's the reaction we got. So, um, you know, remembers a thousand points and you can delete them anytime if you know you're not going to be back. And then um, it's also cool, um, it works up to 24 miles an hour. If you're coming in fast to an obstacle that you've previously remembered, it'll lift it, it'll start sooner. It'll say, oh, I'm approaching this GPS location, guy's not paying attention, he's coming in too fast. The car will say, uh oh, we better get this nose up in the air. So it's smart enough to know when you're not paying attention. our top speed of 194 miles an hour, uh, but we didn't put out a video. Um, so we're going to show you uh, a video of that run, and it's going to start right now. So this is done in Papenburg, Germany. 
uh, is a level track. It's where we've done our top speed runs for many generations of car. And unlike a lot of manufacturers who go out and just run a straight line, uh, run, and whatever the top speed they see on their instrumentation is the top speed they post. That's not really the right way to do it. We have always done it the right way, which means you do a flying mile. So you have to average the speed for an entire mile, and you have to do it in both directions to account for wind. Because typically what you see is a pretty different speed depending on where, which way you're going. So here we are, coming up to 194. And we're not showing you both directions, even though we could, but this is the first time um, in my experience we actually got 194 in both directions. Usually it's like three miles an hour high on one way and three miles an hour and then you average them. Uh, and the videos we typically show show that for some reason they were like dead calm at Pathenburg this year. And so uh, it was exactly the same speed passing one way and the other. So uh, if you watch the video, it's as usual, a non-event, a couple of board development drivers cruising down the road at 194 miles an hour. <laughs> it's just, you know, another day at the office. You know, the car's very easy to drive uh, at speed. It feels uh, extremely planted, and uh, that's why the video is so boring. You don't see the guy wrestling around or trying to catch the car or anything. Um, so we're very proud of, of the stability that we have in the car. Z51 standard? That was the standard car. So the standard car is very slick. So that's the one we use for top speed runs. The top speed in Z51 is 184. So we trade off top speed for downforce. You'll see race car top speeds are not very high. It's because they want to keep the car planted on the ground. I noticed it was in six gear. Not, not six gear is the top speed gear. So I didn't talk about the DCT. We take advantage of the fact that we have 60% of weight on the back. We use a very low first gear ratio. So that gets the car off the line and moving. It's largely responsible for zero to 60 under three seconds. Then gears two through six are your track gears, and six goes all the way up to top speed. Then as we've done historically, our top gears are tall overdrive, so seventh and eighth are great for you know street driving. So you quickly get up to low RPM, it's quiet, it's low mechanical stress, really good fuel economy. So we've applied that same kind of traditional Corvette philosophy to this blank sheet of paper uh, DCT. So I think we got a few minutes for questions. Happy to take it.